Welcome to the Getting Real with Hillary show, where ordinary heroes tell extraordinary stories during unique and never been heard before conversations with your host, Hillary Arno Burns. Hillary's unique listening and way of asking questions results in conversations that aren't usually talked about. So you can create the life that you really want, but are afraid you can't really have. We are demonstrating the greatness and the human spirit in creating a world where we all reclaim our birthright of joy, happiness, purpose, and passion. Now, here's your host, Hilary Arno Burns. Welcome to the Getting Real with Hillary show. And we are about to see a really cool video. So play this role. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, light her up. Guess it's on. I think we're ready. You thinking what I'm thinking? You know, the obsession for revenge. It can destroy you. Really, eat you alive. Oh, come on. Okay, and that is our introduction to David Winning, who we have had on our show before. He's one of the best guests I've ever had. And he is an award-winning director. If you want to hear all about his credits, go to our first interview on YouTube, Getting Real with Hillary show. But for now, we are going to promote his upcoming movie. Welcome, David. Hello. I'm here. I'm back. I'm back. <laughs> so I've got, a, I've got a brand new movie to promote. Uh, my first premiere of the year comes up October 14th on Hallmark Channel. And so I'm all excited to promote that for folks and and uh, talk about it and hopefully people will watch it hallmark channel october 14th well we could play the preview but in your words why should we watch it david i directed it so hopefully it's better than average i uh it was a, it was a lot of fun to do it was a, the movie's called field day and uh it was a different kind of project for hallmark because it was a little bit more uh, funny a little more lighthearted and there's a romance in it as there is in all good Hallmark movies, but the romance is actually kind of secondary, which is, which is fun. The movie's really about these three moms who get thrown together at their elementary school. The kids all go to the same school and they're thrown together and they're from all sorts of different kind of lifestyles and uh, economic backgrounds. And they're thrown together to try to put together the field day, which typically at the school has been a disaster every year. So it's the one that the moms never want to do. And, uh, this year they're in charge of it. So it's all about the hijinks that occur while they try to set this up. And then there's a love interest, but as I said, it's kind of secondary. And it was a lot of fun to make. We filmed it in uh, November last year when all the leaves in uh, Vancouver, Canada were turning red, which is why it's one of the fall movies. And uh, I had to wait 11 months for this to come out and be released. I, I, I saw it finished last Christmas and, um, and it's really, it turned out really, it really, it's a lot of fun. It made me laugh, which is, which is kind of different. So, you know, Hallmark's kind of branching out and trying different things with their stories. And uh, this one's really good. So I hope people can tune in. So without the, ro I mean, there, there is a little romance, but um, do you think people will miss that part? Or do you think they'll get enough of it that they'll be okay? Oh, no. Okay. Oh, there's actually, I shouldn't say little. There's a big romance. It's just that it's not the main storyline this time, which is kind of fun. Uh, okay. But no, there's definitely some romance. You can't do a Hallmark movie without some good romance. So, uh, and in this movie, it's uh, it's the the hero hero male is Ben Ayers, who I've done. It's my fourth movie with Ben. He's a pretty popular Hallmark guy, and uh, we have a lot of fun together. And we have kind of a shorthand when we work together. So it was it was great to be involved with him. And and he's he's a hunky guy. He's the kind of guy Hallmark Hallmark uh, folks like to watch. So. Um, and he's got a great sense of humor, too, which really helped with this movie. All right. Well, why don't we watch the preview? You ready for that? Absolutely. Here's a, here's a trailer from, from Field Day, October 14th. Field Day. I'm on the planning committee. How'd you get roped into that nightmare? Three moms. What is so bad about Field Day? Isn't it just relay races and games? You're 
Take on the mother of all events. We have a problem. Kind of seems that way. Yeah. Anything I can do to help? She is evil. Bring it on. That just defies the laws of physics. Nailed it. Field day. Field day. All new Saturday, October 14th at 8 on Hallmark. Well, that looks really cool. I can't wait to watch it. Where do we tune in on October 14th? Uh, Hallmark Channel in the States, which hopefully a lot of people have. And in Canada, if you're watching uh, Hillary's wonderful podcast in Canada, it's uh, the W Network, which runs most of the Hallmark movies up, up here where I am speaking to you from right now. Okay. All right. Anything else you want to say about the movie? Um, well, it was, uh, you know, it was a lot of fun to make. I mean, it, what's, what's weird about these movies is the Christmas movies, you know, you're usually trying to rush to get them finished in July and August when it's hot and you're doing, you know, fake snow and you're having people bundled up in scarves and parkas. And this movie was done so long ago that I've had to kind of refresh my memory about all the experiences that we had. And it was, uh, it was just, it was a ton of fun to make. I mentioned we got to work with uh, Ben Ayers again. And it was also my fourth movie with uh, the writer, Julie Sherman Wolf. I've done four movies with her now and she's, she's got, she's a great storyteller. And like I said, it's, it's a very, it's a funny movie. So we had fun making it. All of her movies are kind of lighthearted. So uh, no, I think it turned out really well. And it was very, uh, it was a very weather dependent movie. Um, I can't give away too much of the plot, but the, the weather had to be in our favor to make the plot work, which is something that people will see when they see the movie and the gods shined on us. I think we, we were very lucky with, rain and not rain and you, you'll see it if you see the movie it'll all make sense but uh, yeah we were very lucky we had our fingers crossed and uh, i guess we were living the clean life and uh, we got exactly the weather we needed for the, the days we were shooting cool well and we do have another is it a trailer that we can show later this is what hallmark calls a sneak peek that's about a, about a minute of the movie. They may run the trailer again, but there's a little minute of the movie so you can actually see a, a clip from the movie, which is kind of funny, which sets up the, the three um, moms. So you're new to the school, right? Yes, I am. We moved here this summer. I'm Jen, Jen Davis. Well, welcome. I'm Kelly Stewart. This is Marissa Morris. Yes, we met this morning. I would not have known today was the PTO meeting without I her. I am so <laughs> sorry. Can I just ask, what is so bad about field day? Isn't it just relay races and games? Who, who was in charge of field day last year? Michelle Grant. Mm. She homeschools now. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's how it was. <laughs> but excuse me. But it's not going to be how it is. Not with me in charge. Field day. All new Saturday, October 14th at 8 on Hallmark. All right. We're back. The horrors of trying to set up a field day. It'll make sense when people see it. It's funny. So yeah, it's uh, it was a it was a good movie, and I mean I'm it was my uh, my twenty fifth movie for the Hallmark Channel. So as they say, Hallmark Channel's been very good to me, um, and uh, I've had a lot of fun working on them. Most of them have been Christmas movies. Some of them have been just seasonal ones, like this one, which is a fall fall in love they call it autumn movies. So uh, yeah, they've all been good, and and as we've discussed before, I mean the reason I love them is because they're all inspiring, and you know they're they're hope filled movies. They get People, you know, have teased me about them in the past working for Hallmark channels, and then they secretly watch them in private because they love them. Because everybody likes uh, everybody likes feel good entertainment. That's right. It's like Bar like Barry Manilow, which I <laughs> I have occasionally listened to Barry Manilow as well, and I don't want to admit that on a public <laughs> podcast as I've just done. But you know, yeah, right it takes right. takes all kinds. It's the same thing. Okay, so. For the audience, I know I asked you this last time. The difference, you're a director, the difference between the producer and the director. Uh, okay, well, the producer typically is the one that starts the project, is the initiator, and they raise the money and they gather the crews together and they hire the director, which is me. And so they're basically the boss and they're bringing all the elements together. And then the director is the person who's physically there on set kind of interpreting the script and figuring out where the cameras go and working with the actors directly and and using their experience as a filmmaker to try to make the script as interesting and visual as possible. 
Hope that makes sense. That's what yeah, I do. Yeah. I'm, 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 I'm kind of an interpreter of a, of a script. I'm, I'm using my experience and my tastes to, to read a script and think, well, this would be an interesting way to tell this story, or these would be good actors to cast in this story for this particular thing to make it work. But you pick the locations. I do. I, I pick locations and uh, I pick uh, usually the cast. I don't usually pick the first, the two leads or the main leads because they're, they're, um, you know, previous uh, stars from Hallmark Channel movies that have done things that, that they want to work with again, that have good ratings and stuff. But I usually pick all the other casts that are in the movies. And those people are usually friends of mine that I worked over the years. So I end up with kind of a repertory theater company of uh, favorite actors. So you pull them in from other places? On other films that I've worked on. Usually they're in the same area, but it's, you know, people that I've worked on over my career that I really liked and that didn't let me down or were really good actors or fun to work with or great people. I just, I, you, you try to work with the same. And, you know, a lot of Hallmark Channel fans will see the same actors in shows and they think, wow, they, I know this was shot in Canada because I saw these actors, you know, which is great. Oh, I mean, oh. we, we develop our own little uh, uh, th theater company up here. And those are, if they're not the main they're the supporting or there's supporting cast. Yeah. Usually it's like the, anybody below the top two or the, the hero couple. And, uh, you know, sometimes in the case of field day, there were three uh, female leads and then Ben was the male lead. So there was kind of four leads. And then I was responsible for casting all the other actors that are in the movie, the supporting players. So who does all the stuff like feeding them and housing them and stuff? Is that your job or do you have like a logistics? No, we have uh, on our on our massive crew of people. We've got a kind of whole army of people, and there's caterers that keep everybody fed at lunch, and uh, you know they're all put up in hotels. Usually, uh, the act the other actors beyond the stars are local, so they just drive in, and then we have you know the costume departments make sure they look great, great wardrobe, and so for the three weeks before you start a movie, your your main thing is you're trying to find locations and actors at the beginning, and then you get into the whole costume design thing and. Uh, and if you have time, sometimes you even get lucky enough to have rehearsal time, which is pretty rare. But uh, then we get into that. And then we're off really? to the races really? for a very, oh, yeah, there's not much. Rehearsal time is kind of rare in movies, but uh, we do actually have some. Usually what I do now is I do it over Zoom links is because some of the actors aren't in town when we're starting. And so I'll prep in advance before they even get into the city where we're shooting, which is fun. And it's great to bond with people over Zoom before you get a chance to actually meet them. So, okay, so you said there's a script and there'll be like two ladies fighting in a barn and then you'll have to figure out where they're standing, find the barn, do all that. Pretty much, yeah, that's me. Yep. That, that's what, for good or bad, whether I make the right choices or not, that's usually my responsibility. So the writer will say this, here's the scene, like I think I said to you last time, church, five people walk in, stuff happens, you know, shooting or whatever. And you have to figure out the choreography as a director, but where it happens and what's the most interesting visual thing to do and how to photograph it from which angles. And the most important thing of all is how you do all that really quickly, because there's so little time when you're making a movie, usually you're shooting 11, 12 hour days, which may seem long to some folks, but you've got to be very incredibly efficient about how you use time and, uh, and uh, make sure you're not wasting time because if time is money. And as I mentioned to you last time, these movies are sh usually shot in less than three weeks, 15 days, 12 days. I've done one in as little as 11 days, which was quite a rush, but, um, you know, they're expensive. So, it's a labor, a labor, labor intensive industry. So hiring all these people for more and more days just costs the production company too much money. So if you can shoot it in less days, they're very happy. So do you have like spreadsheets that you figure it all out on? How do you... Well, they do, they do a thing that's kind of a shooting schedule. I don't know if I have a sample around here, but they, they break it all down by um, uh, scheduling and stuff. And you, you, you know, you'll do, if you're shooting, you'll do all, all of the scenes that take place in a script in one location. If it's in a church or something, you do all those at once. So that you never have to keep going back into different locations. You do all the church locations, all the school locations within a certain week, because one of the biggest parts of expenses and time and, an effort is moving the entire crew from place to place. So you're trying to shoot everything as, as efficiently as possible. It's all about logistics. 
What'd you say? Logistics. Yes. And that's partly your job. Partly my job. Uh, I rely heavily on production managers and I usually have a first assistant director team, first ADs, second ADs and third ADs that put together the schedule. And then I try to figure out if it's going to work for me and where I can spend more time. Usually you'll, you'll want to spend more time on bigger action sequences. So you'll say, no, let's, let's spend another day at this location so I can shoot the big ending scene properly, or, or we need less time in a, in a restaurant, for example, because those scenes will go quickly if it's just uh, two people in conversation. So you try to gauge the weight of the different days. You won't usually, typically you film eight to 10 pages a day on a show. But if you have heavy action scenes or a big ending scene or a big set piece sequence, you'll, you'll spend more time on that. So you might have one day that's five pages of, of, of script and then one pages that's heavy, like 10 or 11 pages if it's just dialogue. I'm kind of okay, ruining okay. the magic of movies, you know. You're not, no, you're, not. You're, not you're, you're, you're not supposed to think about this when you watch movies. You're only supposed to be into the story and be pulled in and not think about how the director had to figure stuff out. I'm supposed to be like we the Wizard of Oz hiding behind the curtain, you know. So. We want to appreciate all the everything that it takes. So when we watch it, we can go, what a genius. And the well, genius, yeah. The thing that <laughs> trust me. Uh, the thing that I said last time is that the director gets all the credit and all the and all the and all the hatred if they don't like the movies, because it's my responsibility. But the truth is we're supported by hundreds and hundreds of crew people that never really get credit unless you kind of watch the credits race by at the end of a movie. You should watch those credits because those people are as, as important as I am to make a movie. We're all kind of, uh, you know, we're all trying to get, get an almost impossible task done in a very limit, limited time and limited money. But you're not supposed to think about that again. You're only supposed to be into the story and be moved by the actors and the amazing, compelling drama that's unfolding before you. So when I was, uh, I worked down on Wall Street and we were watching out the window, one of the Ghostbusters movies being filmed. And it was, I guess you would call it a huge action shot. I mean, there were all the, limp, there was a zillion people, they were coming down to this place and it seemed like they shot that few seconds, I don't know, 10 times, you know, a lot of times. Would you say they had a bigger budget and a bigger time schedule or is that like what yours would look like no i i mean all movies take a long time honestly it's like watching paint dry people people always think of the movies as really exciting and i've for years have had friends come and visit oh can i come to set and they'll come and visit and they'll sit around for about 45 minutes watching us doing the same thing over and over and over and over and 45 minutes an hour yeah we, we, we think we're just going to head out because uh yeah it's kind of interesting but we're just going to go you know, because literally it takes it takes a full day to shoot a minute and a half, two minutes of a movie. So it, it is it's laborious work, not for me, because I'm right in the heart of it. And when you're in the crew, it's like that's that's the nucleus and everybody's just tense and energetic and trying to get the thing done. And you're so focused on it. But from from your point of view, watching out a window, it must look incredibly boring because it is very it's a very slow paced business. I mean, to make movies well, you have to do them carefully and you have to make sure that especially for Ghostbuster movies with big special effects and things. Stuff just takes time. And those kind of movies have, I mean, I'm shooting a movie in 15 days. They're taking like six months, you know, day after day to, to put the movie together. And that's why, and that's why they're big blockbusters. And that's why they pull in millions of dollars and cost millions of dollars. But, um, and you know, people love those movies. I love those movies. I would like the chance to do one of those big budget movies, but, uh, I'm, uh, I feel like I'm in, I'm still in training camp, I guess, after all these years, I'm still doing the, the low budget movies, but I mean, I love what I do. I mean, you're still making movies. It's still, it's still visual storytelling and working with actors and hopefully you're making memories for people that are going to outlive me. And, uh, you know, these movies will run for years and years and years. Hopefully if, if one of them hits and is, is a kind of a cl Christmas classic, which I've been trying to make with these. So if you say a full day for a minute and a half uh yeah it's usually two minutes two minutes a day three minutes a day so you know obviously the low budget movies you're doing more work in a day but for a big budget feature they're doing a, maybe a minute a day which is why they shoot for 80 90 days to make an hour and a half movie oh okay so so that's the big ones yours are quicker Mine or whatever, whatever 80, whatever 86 minutes divided by 15 is somebody got a calculator. 
that's what I have to do every day, pretty much. I, I mean, it usually it usually works out to. Uh, oh, Hillary's figuring it out. She's got her figuring face on. She's figuring. What is it? Eighty six. Eighty six minute movie in fifteen days. Five point seven three 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 three. Okay, so you're shooting. If you were, yeah. So you're trying to shoot. Look at that. Calcul that's a calculator. Yeah, we're shooting. Uh, yeah, so it's like six pages a day. So I'm getting beamed by. This is beautiful Canadian sunshine, by the way. You're actually seeing live here. Oh wow! 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 Um, yeah, so it, it's very fast work. Obviously, it's uh, it's a lot of concentration and. Uh, but I I know what, I mean I've watched a lot of big movies being shot and it is very boring. I mean. I'm sure you hear people say, is this all it? because people, you know, people have the impression that movies happen at the pace you watch them. So you're kind of expecting this big, oh, look at this great scene being shot. But you're you're not really watching a great scene. You're watching a tiny part of a big scene, you know, and it's just very minuscule. It's like putting together a puzzle and you're watching just a tiny little piece of it being made. So then who edits all those versions? Do you do that? Film editor. The film editor. Not you, not you. Not me, no. But I am, I am, I work with the film editor, and I because he he kind of needs my guidance to because he doesn't he isn't inside my head. Thank lucky for him. But it's he needs my guidance to be able to you know figure out the plan I had and how the puzzle goes together because sometimes it's obvious with an editor, especially if you worked. We talked about this last time. You have a shorthand with people that you work with, and they you know I've worked with a few editors a bunch of times, and they kind of know how I'm shooting a scene. So they think, oh, he, he's doing it this way. That, and so they, they kind of see your plan ahead of time and that helps put the thing together faster. But, you know, you shoot in 15 days and then the editor has like, he's cutting all the way along. So he's, every day he's cut, he's editing the material that you've done so that by the time you've finished, he has kind of a rough assembly and then he gets maybe three or four days to, to clean that up, he sends it to me. And then I have only three or four days to do a director's cut. It all happens so quickly. And then, of course, the producers get two weeks, you know, to fine tune things. But we're kind of rushed into it. But it's just the way it is. I mean, they have they have deadlines and they have an air date that they have to meet. And once the editing is finished, they have to go. It has to go to a composer and the music's all composed. That takes two or three weeks. And again, you're still involved in that process. They're sending back cuts of the music act by act. There's usually nine acts in a in a typical TV movie. And uh, you're, you know, making notes on that and making adjustments. Some of the music you love, we just finished a film and the music I just, I loved all the way through, but there was a couple of music cues that I didn't, weren't really pulling the emotion I felt. So I, I would push the composer carefully because these are all creative people. You don't want to offend anybody, but I, I would, I urged him to try something even more emotional and uh, just came up with this great score at the end, but uh, it's fun. And I, so I'm involved in all those stages. And then the final stage is the, uh, the uh, sound mix where you have all the, music and effects and any additional dialogue that's being written or re-recorded dialogue. If there's like, sometimes you'll be shooting a scene with loud snow machines and you won't be able to hear the actors properly. So the actors have to go into studios and usually in other cities in Los Angeles and do what they call ADR, which is additional dialogue recording. And they'll record like lip sync to themselves so that you can put that new sound in over the top of their, their picture and get rid of the snow machines because snow machines make a lot of noise. It looks beautiful. But it's like giant aircraft uh, equipment working in the background while actors are trying to talk. So, so the sound mix is the last stage, and that's always the most fun. You sit in these big plush theaters, and the movie's projected, and it looks beautiful, and you hear all the music and beautiful quadraphonic or whatever it is, uh, five track stereo, and and uh, that's my favorite. That's my favorite. And then usually about a month after that is when the movie airs. So I just finished recently a Christmas movie that's coming out after Field Day uh, later in the year. And uh, it turned out really well. So I've got uh, two big premieres this fall that I'm excited about. And I hope people really enjoy. Cool. So do you have like, let's say they're using a scene and it's not working. Do you have other versions that you can switch in like after the filming's all done? Or does that not, or happen? Does that not happen? Um, it's all, it always happens. There's always changes that occur because everyone's going detail by detail and saying, you know, this doesn't work for me. Do you have a different close up of this? Or do you have a different performance of this read from an actor? And you definitely can go back into, uh, uh, to the original material and substitute takes and things if you want to, because it's a committee, you know, I mean, it's not, um, you're usually working for a network and they're the ones that put up the money for it. So obviously they have an opinion and if they don't like something, you 
you just try to make them happy. I do that when I'm filming it. I do that when we're editing and when the music's finished right up to the final stages, because as I always say, they're signing the checks, you know, it's not my movie. I'm directing it, but it's, you know, it's their, it's their movie and they wanted a certain kind of product. And if it's not quite right, they'll, they'll make adjustments. They're not shy. They let you know what they don't like. Right. Now, so you, you've done the 25 Hallmark and you did some other movies too. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I've done, how did, how did that happen so quickly? I did, yeah, I did 25 Hallmark channel movies and 20 other movies. I've done 46 movies, I think. Four, wow. Yeah. Anyway, as I said to you last time, I'm tired. <laughs> but were they different? Were they not like a channel movie? Yeah. I've done monster movies. I've done, uh, science fiction, ton of, ton of science fiction. I've done tons of kid series. Um, 29 different television series as well as the, as the 40 plus movies. So I guess I've been busy since the eighties. I started in the eighties doing low budget features. As we talked about last time, I was going to go to film school and I thought, Nope, I'm just going to take all this money and buy film stock and go out and make my own movie like a fool. And if it doesn't work, I will be a dentist or something, you know? And, um, fortunately my first movie worked in fact, um, Storm, the first movie that I did literally shot 40 years ago, summer of 83, when I was blah, 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 years old, um, is about to be re-released. Um, uh, companies approached me about re-releasing it. So they're, this is, you can't tell anybody this, this is completely secret. So you can't, it's, nobody can like plug your ears, everybody, but, uh, Storm's supposed to be coming out in, uh, uh remaster Blu-ray and possibly, possibly some theater release in um, 2025 by a company in Canada that is amazing and is dedicated to promoting 70s and 80s exploitation movies from the Canadian film history, one of which is me. And uh, so Storm should be having a, uh, a re-release and a rebirth sometime in the next couple of years, which is really exciting. So I'm digging through all the old scripts and drawings and, and original negatives and sound mixes and music reels and uh getting it all ready to send off to them and they're going to remaster it. it's going to look better than it ever looked in in theaters when it was released in uh oh gosh 87 many moons ago look forward to that i do so that so they put it all together for you like, they, how does that, that work they take all the original negative and elements like when you take negatives in the old days you don't do this anymore but when you used to take negatives to the drugstore to get your your pictures printed the original, it was film. It wasn't because I'm that old. It was film. So um, they're taking the original negative and they're, and they're uh, basically starting from scratch. I mean, it's the original, they're not changing the film, but they're using the original elements to make the best possible version, remastering it all. So it'll look uh, amazing, which I'm excited about. And then they're going to record uh, interview tracks with myself and some of the crew people and some of the actors to do like a, you know, director's cut commentary and, uh, you know, where are they now? I'm right here. Um, but uh, yeah, it should be, uh, it should be exciting. I'm very excited about it because I'm very proud of my first movie. It really, you know, that's, it's the first time in your, your, it's the first, first, maybe only, I didn't know this, maybe the only time in your career when you have absolute total control over something creatively, because it was all me, there were no networks or producers. And it was like, it's a good film or it's a bad film, but it's all me. It's my choices. So hate it or love it. I loved it. So would you ever do that again? Well, I think that's really what the goal has always been to try to get back into independent production. I would love to do that again because it's, that's, I mean, that launched my whole career. Basically I started directing a couple of low budget features in Canada and that led into a whole kind of a television career and then back into MOWs and eventually Hallmark and stuff too. But I mean, I think you're always trying to get back to, cause I still, I'm still writing things, you know, I'm, I'm always writing and toying with ideas. And I really started in the business because I wanted to be like Steven Spielberg. You know, I wanted to be the, I wanted to make big features like the one you're watching. I wanted to make, a, I wanted to be directing Ghostbuster movies, but uh, there's still time, you know, there's a little gray hair here, but uh, there's still time. And I'm so much better at what I do now than I was back then. Although my first film is still pretty good. So why not? Well, it's very hard to raise money. Tired, tired, tired. 
I, I'm tired. Yeah. Uh, I need to sleep for about 10 years and then I will have the energy to, uh, to pursue my dreams again. No, I, I'm, I love to make, I mean, that's why you, I didn't get into the movies to, or the business to direct for other people, but it's lucrative and it pays your bills and you learn a lot and you meet great people and you travel all over the world. So who would turn that down? But I mean, my, my whole thing was I wanted to make independent films. So I definitely think I should be getting back into that. I don't know if it's, it's not laziness because it's a hard business, but I think it, it's very difficult to raise money and I'm not so sure I want to, you know, put up a house for, for, you know, I don't want to sell a house to make a movie. So, uh, you know, there's a certain amount of reality that sets in. You're like, well, why don't other people pay for these things? But um, I definitely still have the passion to try to get back into independent production. I'm always trying to do that. I've been trying to do that since I, I mean, I shot my last independent movie 30 years ago, Killer Image with uh, Michael Ironside and uh, M. Emmett Walsh. People remember from Blood Simple. He's a great character actor. So would you need your own story for that? Or or if somebody had a story, you would, you could, like, would it be your story? No, I, I, I'm always shopping for scripts and reading scripts and stuff, trying to find things. What I would, I, I can, I could write something independently or, you know, I think I'm probably a better director than I am writer. So I think I would probably prefer to read someone's who someone who's done already the hard work and come up with a story and a plot line and then something that grabbed me and I thought, well, I can make this even better. I can think of some interesting stuff we could do with this. So I'm I'm interested in shopping for some scripts and trying to find somebody else's story. I'm totally open to that. Okay. So you need a story and investors and then it's possible. And you know, winning the lottery would be nice, you know, just to give a little padding. But no, I'm I mean I'm you know, you shop yourself around as a freelance director, but it doesn't necessarily mean you're always doing television series or Christmas movies. I mean, there's a couple of opportunities I've got in the States next year for some pretty big budget stuff that I can't really talk about yet because it's not really confirmed, but there's some great opportunities coming up, I think, where I'm going to have a lot of fun and, and have a lot of involvement in in the, the scripts and trying to make them. I want to make some big blockbuster epic kind of movies now. Yeah, come on. Yeah, what what's, what am I waiting for? for? I'm tired. I'm tired. <laughs> I'm gonna take some vitamins. Yes. All right. We're gonna have we're gonna go to our commercial break with our sponsors. And okay. we'll be right back. Has social emotional learning become just one more thing on your teacher's plates? Do teachers and students both find it boring and ineffective? Then bring Kikori to your school. Kikori transforms classrooms through experiential SEL activities that help students play, reflect, connect, and grow. Even better, students say it's more fun than recess. Schedule a no obligation conversation at kikoriapp.com slash bring Kikori. K-I-K-O-R-I. Do you ever feel like you can't say what you really want to say? Or that you're stuck or in a holding pattern in your relationships, career, personal life, or finances? Are there things you want in life that you've given up on? Are you resigned that this is as good as it's going to get? If you answered yes to any of these questions, then Hillary Burns, host of the Getting Real with Hillary show, has the solution you need. Hillary is a published author of three books and has a program called The Getting Real Process. This process frees you from what is holding you back, allowing you to create a life you love. Don't believe it? It is hard to believe that it could work, isn't it? The proof is that hundreds of Hillary's clients have used The Getting Real Process and are now free to create whatever they want in relationships, career, finances, enjoying life, or just loving themselves more. So go to realtalkwithhillary.com and order Hillary's book, Real Talk, and set up a conversation. Thank you, as always, to our wonderful sponsor, KikoriApp.com, who is bringing experiential social-emotional learning to children to help them feel safe 
and connected. Thank you, KokoriApp.com. And if you're stuck, you can always go to realtalkwithhillary.com and schedule a talk with me and let's get you free and having way more fun. All right. And here we are back with our amazing guest, David Winning, who's about to do his independent production now that we've inspired him. Yep. You got me going. I'm, I'm going to get out there right now. In fact, I'm just, I'm just going to write down some notes right now. Actually, I've got some great ideas. Thank you. <laughs> oh, I'd love to do that. That's why you get into the movies. I mean, I was, I was a, you know, 12 year old, 13 year old kid in my backyard with my little super eight camera, making movies with my friends thinking, I mean, you, you think you can do anything when you're a kid and that that's kind of, I never thought I was going to get to Hollywood or make movies or do, you know, Christmas movies for Hallmark channel or, I, I did a great vampire series for on Sci-Fi Channel and Netflix called Ben Helsing that I'm incredibly proud of, which is the polar opposite of Christmas movies. You know, um, tons of science fiction. I mean, it's, you get to work in all genres. So I didn't know where I was going to lead when I was 12 and 13, but uh, here I am with a career. So, yes, independent production is kind of what you're always trying to get back to. And and you said your backup. If the film business didn't work out, was being a dentist? <laughs> no, I always pick a different career. Uh, I used to say work in a bookstore. Um, uh, what else? Uh, aluminum siding. Um, yeah, all sorts, all sorts of careers. You know, you can have. But I mean, honestly, I think when kids are kids, they it's like you always ask a kid, "What do you want to be? Astronaut or uh, you know, zookeeper or whatever." Everybody's got a dream of what they wanted to do. And honestly, when I was twelve, I wanted to make movies. And somehow I have managed to fool people for 40, 50 years and had a career. But, you know, I, the problem is you end up with no hobbies because your hobby becomes your life. I'm not complaining. So then what do you do on your days off? Watch Look movies? No, oh, I watch movies. Still love movies. I think the day that I stop liking the movies or being excited on set is your signal that you need to quit because you need to have so much energy to make this job kind of a day-to-day -day thing. You, you know, if you're not into, if you're not into what you do, you're in the wrong business. And you were talking about, um, well, the strike, the writers and the actor strike and the AI versions of actors. I don't know if you want to talk about that. I thought that was very interesting. Well, we're all really happy that the writer's strike is over after five months. Um, I don't know all the details, but it sounds like from what I'm hearing that the writers are really happy with the deal they got. It's just a fair deal. I think even the producers are happy. It was just something that was a long time coming. And the actors, uh, unfortunately, are still on strike, which is why I'm doing a lot of the, or I've been asked to do a lot of the publicity for Field Day and the Hallmark movies, because normally the actors would be out. Nobody wants to see me, but the actors are out talking and, and uh, you know, saying, oh, you know, because actors, everybody knows who actors are. Um, but um, one of the things I think we talked about last time was the, one of the reasons the actors are striking is, well, there's a couple, there's a bunch of reasons, but they're not getting, they're not getting money from streaming services that they, that they should be getting. Um, and so they, uh, they're striking for that. And also the other thing is the, the AI component of it is that, uh, you know, producers are wanting to kind of scan an actor's image and voice and, uh, and, and just use them forever in movies and maybe, maybe not pay them or pay them a smaller amount and just kind of use their image for their, for eternity. And uh, so that's kind of scary. That's one of the things they're wanting to work out. And also um, the uh, extras in movies are being hired for one day and having their image scanned. And then the, the production companies are making a bank of armies of the images of extras that they use for 20, 30 years. So you get hired as an extra for one day and then your image is just perpetually used. So you only get paid for one day, but you're going to be on camera forever, which doesn't seem fair. But um, so I think what they're trying to do is they're trying to, they're trying to put guardrails on what AI can potentially do uh, in the future. So who are the people striking? The extras or the regulars or both? Um, at the moment, it's the actors SAG and, and, and after the, the actors unions. And I think the extras, extras are kind of in that, there, there's a component of them. They're doing that, but mainly it's the actors that are out now, the screen actors. And they want, I think they're, they're concerned about AI, but as I mentioned, they're more concerned about the fact that in the old days, they used to say, you know, we're buying your rights for future use of this program for 
uh, movies and television and what they called new media. And back then, back then, 15, 20 years back, new media wasn't really, it was kind of this vague, sure, whatever, I'll sign my rights away to that. But new media is what has become all the streaming services and Netflix. And so the actors aren't being paid for years of their shows being run over and over again endlessly on Netflix and things like that. So that's, that's one of the things that the actors are, are striking and trying to get straightened out. Have I written a script? I've written books. Well, then why aren't you writing a script? Is it different? How is a book? I, I mean, I think you have, a, you will put it this way. Have you ever been to a movie or watched a movie on TV and went, oh, I, I don't like the story. Like, that's stupid. That's why would, then you have to analyze why it is you don't like it, what you would do different, and then just go do it. Because everybody has stories in them. You've written books on, um, you know, nonfiction subjects and help help books and things. But um, I'm sure you have, you, you've I seen have a, a show or something where you think you could do a better job. Oh, I froze. Oh, there I am, I'm back. Um, I have a memoir. Well, there you go. You could do your life story. It could be the Hillary Burns story. Yeah. And if you don't have a director. Come I'm on, just, come I'm on. just saying. I'm it's just a saying, fascinating story. story. You, well, then you could tell your story of your life and we just need to find funding and win the lottery, as we mentioned earlier, <laughs> or sell a house or something. And then there you go. Who would play okay, you, okay. Hillary? Who would play me? Meryl Streep. Me. You play you. You would pay. Well, who could play you better than who could play you better than you? Yeah. Okay. Then what other co-stars, what people have you always wanted to work with that you could put in your movie of your life? How about, how about you and George Clooney? Oh, I'd rather have Kevin Costner. Oh, there you go. Kevin Costner. So it's going to be a Western. <laughs> Hillary Burns in a Western with Kevin Costner. <laughs> Hillary Burns, Kevin Costner, directed by some guy. That would be fun. That would be good. Well, there's nothing wrong with it. That's how dreams happen. You know, you create something you think, or, you know, a lot of writers come up with stuff in their dreams. They dream something, they think, oh, that would make a cool movie, and then they just write it. That's where all this stuff comes from, I think, is our subconscious. But how, so how... I'm just thinking, how is the book different than a script? It's got to just be scenes. You don't have all the backstory narrative. Well, it, it does have some description and things about scenes and how, you know, what, it, what a sequence looks like or a descriptive path on where your landscape is, where your story takes place. But then it's broken up into dialogue sections, the actor's names or the character names come up in the center of the script. And then their little dialogue is kind of indented and then it goes back to description and things. So it's, it's very much like a narrative form. It's just that the dialogue is all pulled out and, uh, and put in the center. Basically that's, that's the only difference between books and movies and in, in terms of scripts, like, you know, books and scripts, narrative, the narrative structure is very similar, a lot of description and scripts, but usually when you're flipping through them, you kind of ignore that because it's like, um, I just want to read the dialogue. I just want to see what, what's happening with the story. That's how I read books. I skip the, the scriptures. Flip to the last page and find out who did it. No, no. I'm thinking who would be my ex-husband. Which actor? <laughs> well, there you go. You gotta, you're going to have a casting session today now. I'm trying to think of who's going to populate your life. I know, it is kind of fun, but I guess like you say, that's that's how they start, right? Well, I think, you know, just, I mean, actors start with, I mean, writers start with blank pages. I have so much respect for writers. You know, they went through this, this whole horrible long strike. And like I said, we, we think they've got a great deal and they're happy and they're going to be compensated properly, but without a script, you got nothing. So you have to have a lot of respect for the writers. And it seems to me that their pay scales and the changes that they've come to now are giving them at least a lot more respect than they had. I'm, I'm just excited that the late night talk show guys are back. I had a great time last night catching up with Seth and Colbert and all my favorites. So, but it wasn't like, if you're a writer of a movie, you weren't on strike because you're just writing your own stuff. These were writers for shows. Well, I, I, I would imagine 
most world writers or writers in the States were still writing all through those five months, but you can't really sell anything because it's all guild protected. And, you know, I don't think writers ever stop writing. It's like directors are kind of directing how breakfast goes and directing how their car is fixed this afternoon. You know, it's like you think of everything visually when you're in the film business. So I don't, I don't imagine writers would ever take time off. They just keep working. Hopefully have a whole backlog of scripts to be offering to people now that they're uh, settled. So now they can sell them. Yep. And like you said, series workers or staff writers of shows can now go back to work, which is why the talk shows have reappeared. Thank goodness. Late night oh, talk wow. shows. I'm not talking about daytime, just late night stuff I love. And usually it's just the monologues I love. But... So when you're, what did you say about breakfast? You're actually directing your breakfast. Oh, I, I mean, I think when you're, when you're in the film business, you kind of, when I come off a show, I'm usually planning shots for a show for three or four weeks after I finish a show. It takes me, to, it takes me about a month to come down from a movie because you're under such pressure to get things right and make the best choices for camera angles and use your taste in the best way and spending people's millions of dollars properly that when you, when you get over and you're wrapped, it's like, I don't let it go for three or four weeks. So, so when I say breakfast, it's like, I'm thinking about, should I cover this cereal bowl from a different angle in the morning? You know? I mean, that's just how you think when you're a director, I think at least that's how I do it. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm obsessed, but I've been doing this since I was 10 years old, if you can imagine thinking visually with cameras and stuff. So a lot of it is second nature, but at the same time you get kind of, that's a major fixation. Yeah. That's me visual, visually seeing stuff, you know? So. So, okay. So let's picture you're taking your cereal bowl down. Oh. What's, what's happening? We're going to make a, we're going to make a movie called the cereal bowl, the story. <laughs> no, of but like what, what is your natural way? I mean, I don't, I just put it on the counter, but, would you actually? Oh gosh, I have no idea. <laughs> I mean, I, I mean, I just, I, I mean, I, what I, what I meant is not how I would shoot it, but how I think of. You kind of think of yeah, your life yeah. in pictures and images and things, you know. So, um, and it gets very melodramatic. It's like suddenly you have a score going with your life. He's pouring the milk on the cereal. Ba -bum. I mean, that's kind of what I do every day. So, yeah, makes yeah, for, makes, for, makes for an interesting life, but. Uh, or sometimes right. I just don't do that. I just eat or I just right. get no, car I, fixed I just, or I, I mow, just, I you know, I mow the lawn and I don't care about what camera angles I'd use to cover it. You know? <laughs> it's just interesting because it's a different world, you know, like, what am I going to think about? Well, I think, My I mean, you probably, I mean, you, you, emails. emails, it's kind of boring, boring you, know? you know? No, I, I would imagine you probably spend a lot of time thinking about how to help people because a lot of your books are about helping and supporting people. So you probably see situations and people and conversations. You think, Oh, I, I know what I would suggest, but when you're helping people in life, you have to be very careful because not everybody wants your help, you know? And, you know, guys are typically oh, I'll fix that. And, you know, some people don't want that help, but so I would imagine right. that's probably how you see things as you think where you can, where you can help and where you can, you know, give people support, which is amazing. Yeah, or even if a show's coming up, like, what are we going to start with? How are we going to do the conversation? Stuff like that. Stuff like that. Yeah, exactly. And you're Keep helping me out because you're helping me out and you're helping folks out by promoting their little silly movies or books or whatever they've got coming out, you know, because obviously I worked really hard on this movie as an example. And so I'm excited to get the word out and hopefully, hopefully people will watch it and be entertained by it. Yes. So anything you'd want to say, I know we're going to we're all going to watch your movie on October 14th, Field Day on Hallmark. Hallmark Channel and W Network in Canada. And the only other thing I would say is I spent most of COVID revamping my, uh, I've had a website for about 20 years that was very antiquated and backwards and people were teasing me about it for years. You need to upgrade those menus and you need to add videos and stuff. So most of COVID I spent trying to revamp my website, which is www.davidwinning.com. So anybody who wants to go visit my website and learn about, you know, my early days or the first time I was in the newspaper when I was 18, making my first movies or, you know, about 135 clips of video from all sorts of different movies and shows I watch. I'd certainly invite you to go there. And there's, there's background interviews. There's, there's a great interview I did with Hillary Burns that's on there. And 
this new one might even be on there fairly soon. And uh, yeah, so, you know, there's lots of interviews and collections and tons of photos and famous people that I've worked with and stuff. So I invite people to go there and check it out. Now, I keep thinking about the one when you were young. You had a, you were with your friends doing this three thing. Uh, I think yeah, I did. There's a, there's a bunch of collections on, uh, I have a, on my, on my website, there's a, there's a thing you can click on called extras. And when you click on that, there's something called a way back machine. And on that page, there's a bunch of videos. See, I have, I have no pride. I just put up all the stuff I did from my teen years where I look like a complete fool with my friends. And we used to do stuff like driving around on the grass, pixelated with no cars and visible cars. And uh, it's tons of fun. That's what I did in my teen years. And I was just desperate to try to become a director and figure out a way to make this a living so I didn't have to have a real life and a nine to five job because I didn't really want that. I'd rather have a 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. job in the film business, which is actually worse. But uh, <laughs> at least you're, uh, you know, you're making your dreams a reality, which is success, I guess, as long as you're happy. Yeah. Well, that, the, for some reason, the one with you and your friends stick, stuck in my head, you know? Well, they'd be... you were, yeah, you were so young and just so freely being creative and expressing and not worried about who was watching or what people thought. I thought it was so, you know, it's like dance, like nobody's watching. I think, um, yeah. you know, I, we just had so much fun making those movies too. We just laughed and laughed when the cameras were rolling. It's just, you know, we're just fooling around. I mean, I, if I had done more of what I really wanted to do in life, it probably would have been comedy. And instead I've spent a long time doing, uh, you know, science fiction and monsters and, uh, and the Christmas movies, which I've loved. And it's all been great, but uh, I have a great respect for comedy. So some of those early movies are pretty silly, but that's what I was when I was a kid, you know, and we were just, just had a super, don't give a kid a camera. That's what happened to Orson Welles. Um, but, uh, you know, we had a ton of fun and I was able to learn how to express myself visually with a camera and uh, somehow made it pay and get a salary. Well, from let's. It. All right, so let's get you into comedy with an independent film. You need investors and the lotteries. Okay. And a good script. You can send donations to my website too. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, start, I'll start a fund. But uh, no, I mean, my, my main thing, Hillary, my final point is always, I think my job is to try to inspire people now because I've had incredibly good luck in my career. And I'm just trying to inspire people to think that, you, you know, whatever your dream is, whatever you really want to do, why not just go for it. Like we talked about last time, because I did it naively. I just kind of blindly pushed ahead and tried to figure out a way to get the Hollywood and I made it. So uh, whatever made it is, I mean, I'm in the film business and I've managed to survive for three or four decades. So I, I just, I try to inspire people to not give up on whatever it is they really wanted to do with their lives because it's never too late. No. And my dream was to have a show where I interview people and they tell their stories look at and look what you know what is this what is what we're on right now it's like say you've made a dream come true and, yeah, you, wrote, and yeah. you probably wanted to write books and you did that too yeah so yeah. you know i just i just i, I always I, I cringe when i hear people saying oh well i really wanted to do this well, why don't you do it you know why don't you try it why don't you you don't want to get to the end of your life and think oh i could have tried that Any, anybody do anything i mean so many people have it's, it's not one career in life it's like i think it's the statistic was that people have like four or five careers now, you know, and it's never too late. You retire from something and you throw yourself into something else and write a book or paint a picture or uh, learn how to be a ballerina or whatever. You know, this is, it's just people have to do what they love to do because it makes life so much more fulfilling and happier is to be able to express yourself or, or do what you imagine, always imagined you were going to be doing. I know it sounds like pie in the sky stuff, but I mean, I literally was this kid who had no way of getting to Hollywood and I, found a way just because I never gave up, you know, I just kept trying and I just figured eventually I'm, I'm going to learn to get good at this and then people will see it and then they'll hire me and, you know, on and on. So what would you tell people who have a dream, but haven't gone after it yet? 
Well, I think I was really lucky. I think I would suggest people try to find mentors in the field that they're interested in, you know, try to find people that are doing what you think you want to do and just go be around them and find out what it's all about. Maybe you'll discover you don't really want to do it. But when I was 13, 14, 15 in high school, I got uh, these two mentors in my life that sadly are gone. One just passed away a couple of weeks ago, but uh, people who really helped me have access to equipment and technology when I was trying to make movies. And I'm not sure I ever would have got in the film business if I haven't been given that support. And so now, like I said, I feel like now at this stage, I've got to try and help people get into this business or any business they want to get into to just try and help people to realize that anything's possible. Mm. It's great advice. Hope well, so. thank you. Thank you. We are so looking forward to field day and thank you so much for being back. Great. Thanks, Hillary. Thanks for asking me. Yeah, and we'll look forward to your next movies. Yay! <laughs> Bye-bye, everybody. Thank you for watching this episode. I started getting real with Hillary when I discovered that I was a people-pleasing, pleasant phony and wanted to be more of my real self. We can grow together if you will like the show, subscribe to my channel, and share this episode with your friends and family so that we can have a world that's more real.